Fantastic. Well, thanks for everyone for joining today. We are excited about today's topic. Uh, the topic today being how to protect your personal data uh, while at home or uh, while working uh, on the road. Uh, my name is Taylor Wells. I am the Director of Strategy here at NW Techs. Uh, we are an advisory firm focused on helping small and medium-sized organizations uh, really utilize their technology in the best way possible. Today, I'm joined by Josiah Poling, who are, is our Director of Admin uh, and is one of the chief implementers um, on our team of uh, security strategies for a lot of our businesses and organizations. He also uh, authored a guide that talks about digital hygiene and really how to uh, protect your personal data. Um, he's joining me on, on the webinar today. Thanks so much for being here, Josiah. Thanks for having me, Taylor. It's a pleasure. Great. I do want to mention uh, as well that this webinar is really going to be focusing on uh, personal data and how to protect uh, your data personally, and really how to have a, uh, a digital hygiene mindset of how to look at all of your technology, whether it's personal or corporate, um, and learning how to have the best uh, procedures and, um, and tools and uh, processes in place to protect your data personally. In the future, we do plan on uh, hosting discussions around uh, corporate uh, cybersecurity, as that is actually our main focus from a business standpoint. Um, so stay tuned for specific uh, webinars around cybersecurity uh, for, uh, from a corporate standpoint, because uh, that is a very different, uh, similar uh, in ways, but also uh, much different than how you treat your personal data and your, your home office or um, remote um, uh, technology. A couple uh, housekeeping items before we get started today. We will be recording this webinar. Uh, so if you aren't able to attend uh, the entire webinar or uh, if you would like to share it with somebody else in your organization, we will be uh, recording it and you can, you can feel free to pass it on. Um, we will also be including uh, a link to that uh, guide that kind of goes in uh, more in depth into the, the specific resources you can use um, uh, from this webinar um, in regards to, the, we'll be recommending lots of tools throughout the webinar or different resources online you can utilize. All those links will be in that blog post that we'll share in the next couple of days. We'll also have a Q&A in this uh, webinar as well, so feel free to submit your questions um, now or throughout the webinar. Um, if you do submit them now, we may be able to cover them throughout the webinar and make sure we, we uh, we uh, customize this webinar to to you, um, and then we'll also try to get as many, to as many of them at the end as well. Um, feel free to click on the chat icon in the webinar. It's really the easiest way. You can share your uh, Q&A questions with a panelist. Um, that's Josiah and I, or you can share them with the entire audience if you want it to be a group discussion. Fantastic. Without further ado, we will uh, move on into the webinar. Um, like we've talked about, we, we mentioned a little bit about who we are. We're an advisory firm uh, focusing on helping businesses with technology. And today we're talking about how ultimately how uh, you can utilize a lot of these business practices in your home office or in at home or with your personal data. Some of the agenda items today, um, some of the things we're going to be covering are uh, first, what is digital hygiene? Uh, it is uh, a, a rather new term or concept. Uh, so we'll be covering kind of an overview of that. We'll be going into specifics of how to, how to achieve that, which uh, main ones being the following, how to have a real, real secure email and having one of the best practices in uh, email um, security, um, password management, um, MFA at home. Uh, a lot of organizations have multi-factor authentication uh, set up in their organizations um, and is required across uh, a lot of organizations. But are you implementing that at home and, and what, are the, um, what are the obstacles and opportunities there? A couple of other things we'll be covering today are reviewing your online accounts um, to see opportunities for either accounts that have been breached or um, counts you just forgot about that uh, are potential uh, uh, risk factor for yourself. 
and then um, securing your devices, actually securing your hardware um, when it's not in the office, and then how to protect your data in transit. So uh, tra when your data from your home office or in the, on the road, um, or just uh, your own personal data, right? If you're logging into your bank account, or uh, how, how are you doing that? If you're, you know, if you're logging into public Wi-Fi's, or, um, or you know, what, what sort of means are you transferring that that sensitive data? Um, so we'll be covering that, and then lastly, we'll be uh, wrapping up with the Q and A. Fantastic. Well, first, let's get started on on what is digital hygiene, Josiah. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, digital hygiene is one of those habitual practices that uh, I, I threw in the word hygiene because it really is reminiscent of, you know, cleaning your kitchen before you make a meal or your daily shower or any of the other uh, natural hygiene um, habits that you have with a new threat landscape like um, the digital one. There's certain habits that you'll want to keep in mind and practice if not frequently, um, you know, semi semi weekly, once a year, that kind of a thing. Um, and they're like spring cleaning, you know, um, a, a chance at least once a year to go through all of your stuff and think about where your data lives and what risks you might have and how to mitigate those. So Great. there's, um, yeah, we've got several different topics here. You know, everything from secure email to password management, multi-factor authentication, and uh, digital hygiene at, at its core is how to protect your data both in transit and at rest. And what does it look like to keep yourself and your loved ones safe? That's great. Thanks, Josiah. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's, it's uh, even uh, at my time working at NW Techs and, and my involvement in working with technology, um, I've grown in just my awareness of seeing uh, just opportunities to be aware ultimately of what's out there and what are the risk factors. And I love how you mentioned family um, and people you love, because ultimately I think mm -hmm. uh, this is something we're all, all learning and um, all opportunities for all of us to grow and then help one another too. And, and that's also a trickle down effect because um, if you can help uh, your family members, then and, and in conjunction, um, they can help keep you safe in, in the same way in your business, right? If you can keep uh, the rest of your team safe, um, your team can keep you safe and not compromise your, your personal data or your company data. Sure, yeah. Yeah, oh, this topic is really aimed at the individual, but um, you probably know that as an individual, you have a responsibility for other people in your life, friends, family, um, maybe even coworkers who are friends. Um, and you know, that, that responsibility, uh, extends past yourself to anyone who will let you help them, right? If you've got, uh, some of the things we'll talk about in this webinar, um, really are risks for people who are new to technology. So this is both young people um, who have never experienced technology or older people who are just getting into it for the first time or um, you know technology technologically illiterate is the term that comes to mind um, and and that's not a that's not a slam on anyone who doesn't know how to right. use technology it's just that anyone who does really has the responsibility to help those around them that needs help right um, definitely so, definitely and it's and it's definitely an evolving problem i think uh, even in our industry where we're dealing with uh, much more complex uh, environments other than even just uh, some, you know, maybe a household um, infrastructure technology, uh, we, you know, there's still, it's, it, it's humbling because it's still an evolving problem, right? And so, like you said, it's, it's the ones that are, that can help. Um, and then, you know, Josiah, when we were preparing for this webinar, I, uh, one of the biggest things I learned was just how, um, a lot of the, the predatory uh, type um, digital crime that is happening on the internet is focused and, and, and prioritize the, the illiterate and the weak and the people that don't have access, um, uh, whether it's visually or audially or, or other impairments, and mm -hmm. they prey on them, right? And that's what, that's not only uh, wrong on multiple levels, but um, that also gives us the opportunity to be like, hey, how can we how can we not only protect ourselves, be aware, 
of what we need to put in place, then um, the the people in our family and in our lives, um, and and maybe that's us someday, right? Maybe we need, maybe we, and we, that's why we need to continue to learn as well. Absolutely, yeah. Learn, um, mm -hmm. Because I think that's what uh, will ultimately help us, uh, yeah, stay stay uh, relevant um, to the problems that are coming up. Um, and then help yeah, I hope my kids take the time to show me how their new holographic tech works in the future. <laughs> totally. Hey, well, this is being recorded, so you can share that with your kids someday so they can uh, make sure you can't hold it. that against you. <laughs> That's great. Fantastic. Well, let's jump into um, some specifics of ways that uh, we can do that. And, and especially currently right now, what are we seeing? as opportunities for digital hygiene the main one being secure email um Josiah, let's let's talk about that sure yeah so right right up there at the top i've got how to spot a phishing email and uh in this topic i really don't go through how to send an email securely that's kind of a different topic and if you're looking for encrypted email that's generally more of a corporate thing uh first off just quick side note I don't recommend sending any personal information through email. Um, chances are that can be intercepted. So uh, text message is a little bit more safe, but really pick up the phone and call the person. Um, so just throwing that out there, um, you know, uh, certified mail is a great way to send documents. Uh, call the person, give them your credit card information. If that's, you know, a transaction that you're comfortable doing over the phone. Um, but back to how to spot a phishing email. Um, yeah, there, there, there are several things that you want to keep keep your eye out for um, when you get an email that you're unfamiliar with. Um, we've got uh, some phishing campaigns that we've actually set up here in our office that test our staff uh, so that they, A, know what a phishing email looks like when it comes through, and uh, so that um, our, our administrative staff gets alerted if an employee um, fails to catch a phishing email. So we've gotten pretty good at catching phishing emails and there's some key things I'd like to show you. Uh, Taylor, could we go to the next slide and uh, take a look at some of those examples? Yeah, definitely. So here's an example. Um, there's a couple things that immediately strike me as being weird about this email. Uh, first off, the font is kind of weird. Obviously, that's not an indicative measure that this is a, a fake email uh, or, or a phishing email. Um, actually, could you go back one, Taylor? Yeah, thanks. Um, different companies will have different fonts, but uh, this one just doesn't look standard. It doesn't look like something corporate a corporate company would send out. Second, there's this email address up there at the top. Um, it's highlighted blue. It says no reply at support.com. Well, that's really vague. Mm -hmm. If USAA really had a domain name, don't you think it would be USAA.com or, you know, something something a little bit more official than just support.com? That, that looks spoofed to me. That looks weird. Mm -hmm. um, and then if this person is really trying to contact you as part of their security measures, they're going to mention you by name. Dear mm. USAA user, this is this is totally just a, a, a blanket market email scam, right? They're trying to send this out and see who responds. Right. Um, and, and then the last thing, they've got a HTML page in there. And right. chances are, if you click on that, there's something malicious that's going to run mm. in there. And uh, Obviously, I don't know what it is because this is just a picture, but those are the things that jump off the screen at me. Definitely. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, but all, all things being said, it's interesting because a lot of these emails, um, there's so much information in them. And if you were to read it, you, you could probably, yeah, just even dissecting it or looking at the font or, or looking at the details. But it's amazing about, especially emails like this, is there, there's enough detail in there that if people are moving fast um, or or just not paying attention to the details, uh, I can easily you know see clicking on something or um, especially a, a file attachment like that because that kind of looks mm -hmm. like a file which doesn't necessarily look like uh, and maybe a website. And if you didn't know what HTML uh, was or what that would be opening up, then yeah, so I could I could definitely see how that could come through though. 
um, of just yeah sure yeah. I, I imagine if you clicked on that link it would download that HTML page and they've got a little right here in the middle they've got some instructions on what they expect you to do uh, they want you to open that web page and instead of going to a website and the server downloading an HTML page and your browser rendering it like a normal web page would, they actually have you download it so your computer can render it. Um, because whatever it is, is probably intended to look just exactly like USAA's mm. website. And it's got some hooks in there to be able to send data back to whoever's, whoever's skimming for that, so. Okay, next example, there's some good ones. Here's a good one. So this one's from mcom.bankofamerica.com. So that's a weird <laughs> domain name. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, let's see, what else about this one? Oh yeah, here's the name thing again. Dear business customer. Right. Bank of America knows your name. It's on your account. They can customize emails to come directly to you. So the, the thing about this one is that, again, they're just trying, the scammers are just trying to send out an email and they don't know who has accounts and who doesn't. You might mm -hmm. not even have a Bank of America account. Mm -hmm. I know I don't. If I get right. this email, I'm immediately suspicious because I don't have a Bank of America account. There's no way this is for me. Um, on top of that, they want me to update a digital certificate. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me, but this is clearly designed for someone who doesn't know what a digital certificate is, mm -hmm. and they want you to click on the link and follow the instructions. And I'm sure that'll mm -hmm. take you to a website that's uh, either either misleading at best mm -hmm. or malicious, mm -hmm. straight up malicious. Interesting, yeah, and, and definitely with the digital certificate that, that kind of runs the last one with being uh, very much preying on uh, the ignorant because yeah, what is a digital certificate? I don't even, I don't, is that even sure? Thing? It's one of those things you attach to a website to make sure that it loads properly and so that you can get HTTPS. Uh, this isn't something that your average right. user actually needs to work with or deal with. So, right. and, and definitely not with your bank. Definitely. Yeah, so a, a lot of these are actually aimed at people with um, less experience with technology, lower IQ, um, or you know, just again, less familiarity with technology. They're specifically trying to weed out the people who are going to catch them in their scam. They're looking only for people who are vulnerable. Um, this is why I'm hoping to equip anyone who's attending these webinars to be able to not only help themselves, but help their friends and family. Um, because these kinds of phishing emails get people. Uh, chances Definitely. are when you go to that digital certificate updating procedure link right there in the middle with the red, it's mm -hmm. psychologically designed to capture your attention. They want you mm -hmm. so bad to click on that link. That's mm -hmm. a grab your attention link. When you get there, it's probably not Bank of America's website. They ask you to put in your credentials, and now they've got your online credentials for Bank of America. You can absolutely wire money away from uh, Bank of America's website. So, you know, that's a great way for your grandmother or uh, your young kid with a brand new Bank of America account with $100 in there to accidentally mm. lose all of their money. Um, fantastic way for that to happen. And we hear about email scams, viruses, some really, really intelligent stuff that hits really large corporations, right? Right. And those people do make bank on that. Um, yeah. But the criminals who prey on the individual user and the small business makes way, way, way more money. Because if you can gather $100 from a million people, chances are you can't get $100 million dollars for one super advanced scam definitely yeah that's that's a great point and i think that's uh, ultimately yeah their marketing is all designed to uh for that and uh which yeah is even more pathological and scary that they can uh they're they're trying to get us to actually not have these conversations because they want to have ultimately uh the people that that are aware or trying to be, yeah, that are, that are aware of these things, not to, to share them. Um, yeah. 
Okay, what's next, Taylor? Do we have another slide here? Yeah. Oh, here's a good one. So here's actually a phishing email that we sent to uh, Taylor to see if yeah, he would fall me. for it. And uh, <laughs> he didn't, he's a smart guy. He caught it right away. <clears throat> and uh, we happen to have this extension in our emails called uh, Catch Fish. And it's something that we offer to clients. And it allows you to um, recognize a phishing email that we sent out. And obviously these phishing emails aren't actually malicious. They're just there to test users and to uh, make sure that we all stay on our toes. And Taylor was obviously on his toes because he caught this fish. <laughs> well done, Taylor. <laughs> Tell us more yeah. about this tool. Yeah, it was, it's fun. I think it's, uh, I, I enjoy the uh, competitive nature or at least even um, yeah, being, you know, the po re positive reinforcement through, you know, obviously a little uh, uh, score and recognition, but really, yeah, it's, it's cool. Essentially, you know, we get regular emails um, throughout the week that appear to be legitimate emails. This one was notable because uh, first there's somebody in our organization that, that that's named Kevin and Kevin is, is, is a common enough name um, that you can do that that it will grab my attention. So it actually did get my attention. I was like, oh, what, what does Kevin want? Um, and then a payroll update being something, you know, internal related, right? So it sounds like somebody I work with, and then it also uh, is something that's relevant to, to my position and my job. Um, and so, yeah, it was something that, that I was like, oh, wow, this is a great example um, of one that, I, that actually grew my attention and, and I was going in to click or review or whatever Kevin sent me. And then, of course, I realized, actually, wait a sec, what, what is this? Like, yeah, and then I saw the email. I think that was the first thing that I noticed was the Kevin at transferportal.tech. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's something I automatically, it's just ingrained in me now, and you've mentioned this already a couple times, is looking at the email address, actually looking at where does the email come from. Um, and then a couple of the other things, too, being, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, looking at, uh, clicking on a link. I think uh, I am I usually never click on links uh, nowadays unless I know who it's from or I've verified yeah, that's a great all point. those other things. Um, just because so nine times out of 10, it's, it's, uh, it's usually not going to be, um, especially when it's financial related. That's the other thing. Um, when it's financial related, when it's payroll and stuff like that, um, I think having a, a best practice of not embedding links uh, has been something that I've noticed is like, hey, I usually don't get embedded links for financial related things. Right. Um, so that's another thing I'm just like, uh, you know, the link automatically sent up a red flag um, even after the email. Um, but ultimately, it was a great example because I think it tied into, it was short and simple. Um, it was, they also, they, our system, um, uh, no pun intended, but tailors it to us or whoever the end <laughs> user is. So they put my name in it, right? So it, mm -hmm. it does feel like mine. And then um, I can't show it in this example, but it uh, in your email, you know, in the email preview, you'll see hi, Taylor, and it looks actually quite legitimate. So this sure. is a great, yeah. that's a great system um, that tests us and keeps us on our toes and kind of keeps us focused on, on those things that are important to look for. Here's a couple of things we can learn from this example right here. Uh, we can't do it because this is a photo on a slide deck, but if this were in your email, uh, Taylor could hover his mouse over the here link in the please click here to see a copy mm -hmm. of the voided check. And uh, you would be able to see down on the bottom left-hand corner in Outlook or whatever your mail client is, where that link goes. And now Outlook's got this new safe link procedure um, so it makes it a little bit difficult to see exactly where that link goes. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you look closely, you'll be able to see the domain name of mm -hmm. that link um, and, and where that will take you. <clears throat> Obviously, Outlook has some built-in protection there. So that's, uh, that's really Very helpful. Very cool. Yeah, and good Another thing that. is For sure. in, in that uh, to field where it says Taylor Wells, that actually does come to Taylor Wells' email address. But I've seen spoofed emails where the from just has a name and it doesn't look like it has an email address mm -hmm. there. And you would think, oh yeah, this is really from Kevin, whoever, my coworker, my friend. Um, and uh, you'd 
have to hover over that or expand or look at the message details to actually see that email address because chances are, um, mm. especially if it's a phishing email, that person didn't hack into that your friend's email address to send that. They just happen to know that you guys are friends. Um, and long analysis on how they might know that, uh, whether Facebook or, or something like that, but they found some connection there and they're trying to exploit that. So uh, you can help keep your friends safe by if you ever need to ask for financial information from them, you know, whether it's a home business deal or something like that, um, call them, call them, call them, call them, call them and say, hey, did you send me a check? Hey, did you send me an invoice? Hey, I just want to make sure before I sent you money, uh, because I know you're stuck in Mexico and you got robbed, that I'm sending money to the right Kevin here. Can I verify these details with you? Because who knows, your friend may actually need you know, a thousand bucks to get back from Mexico. That's not an totally. un unheard of scenario, right? But you want to make sure you're not giving it to a, a foreign uh, scammer, right? Definitely. So, um, and in this great, in this example, it's a very legitimate request, right? Updating avoided checks, um, sure, or, yeah. or updating your your direct deposit. Like if it was a mm -hmm. if it was a, a vendor or somebody, or even just you know Comcast or whoever you know, uh, a, um, a utility provider, right? Yeah, updated, right. updated direct deposit. Hey, can you please provide a voided check? Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, yeah it's this is where that, it's really important to not go to the links in your email. I know they look like they've been provided there for your ease of use. Instead, just go to PGE's website or go to your utility company's website. Mm -hmm. Log into the portal that you've created there. If you don't have one, you can sign up for it. Uh, or call them and create an account, or call them and update your information. Uh, their phone number is public information. You can find it on Google, uh, on their website, or in a phone book if you still have one. And uh, yeah, you know you can go right to their website and find that message they sent you. Almost every utility company, every apartment company, every um, bank company now has a secure message portal that you can log in and see messages from their corporate account, and see what you need to do to update your account. But under no circumstances do you need to click a link and go to a fake sign-in page and sign in your details and there the rest of your money or your retirement or personal information. I love it. And I think what you said too, as you, you mentioned too earlier, is call them or whoever it is, whether it's family mm -hmm. members or whoever it is, call them and verify. Because I think um, I haven't necessarily experienced this from a personal side, but from the corporate side, We've seen uh, very uh, uh, kind of a long socially engineered um, scam or, or compromise where the email, somebody got access to their email and they monitored their emails over a couple months. And then when, bus when a, uh, a business activity or some sort of sensitive data was, was going to be in transit, they then stroke and then uh, tried to get involved in um, yeah, to be a bit more specific, this this one company, um, the owner had a, they had been monitoring his email, they looked at his calendar. Uh, so, you know, we'll get to multi-factor authentication, but that's how you keep bad guys from breaking into your email. Mm. But they had been monitoring his email account, and uh, they saw that he had a meeting with his banker. And ahead of him meeting with his banker, they asked his banker from his email account to transfer money to an account that was not the account holder. And uh, obviously the bank ended up covering that because that was the banker's fault for oh. having processed that request without verifying either in person or on the phone with the live person that that uh, transaction ought to go through. But, you know, somebody just gave uh, a malicious individual and I forget what it was. I, it was some enormous sum. It was over twelve thousand right. dollars. I, right. I think it was closer to twenty. Um, so yeah, yeah, it definitely. Don't feed the and bad guys lunch. Yeah, and there is a uh, probably that moment that a banker was like, "Well, what are the odds, right? What are the odds right. that yeah uh, that somebody would have been right? Yeah, just at the, it would have been too perfect, right? Too perfect of a situation um, where they could have known." Uh, that they were meeting and known, you know, the whole history of of their relationship, or known bits bits and pizza, pieces enough to at least be able to intercept and um, manipulate the conversation. Uh, yeah, you know what's more inconvenient 
than a 25 second phone call to verify account information, having your account information stolen, having to talk to the police yeah. and, you know, maybe never getting that information back uh, or the assurance that it's safe uh, or, you know, in a financial scenario, losing quite a bit can be devastating. Definitely. Definitely. Well, let's, we have a couple more things around secure email. Um, let's cover those. Okay. I won't take too much time on this, um, but just like you organize your kitchen so that A, you know where everything is and B, so you can clean between the containers. Uh, it's important that you go through your email, um, go through every single email. And uh, if you don't seem to have the time for that, that's fine. Ar archive stuff and catch it as it comes back in. Um, <clears throat> if you archive stuff, you can always go and find it later. But as you go through your email, you'll find that you've got a Walgreens account and a Rite Aid account and a Costco account and all of these accounts that have either your personal information on it or your personal information and your financial information on it. And if you're not ready for that company or you're not still comfortable with that company holding that information, now's a chance to call their support team or log into their website and uh, either delete that account or remove the data that's there. Um, and oftentimes, if you can't find out how to do that, a quick Google search will give you that information or even further calling their technical support team. Really doesn't take too long. I do this pretty frequently, actually, um, because you don't know when you're going to have another target um, credit card credit card scam like they had. Um, they had some hackers break into their terminals and steal all the credit card information for the past, I think it was five years. So that's a pretty significant wow. amount of time for your credit card information to get leaked. Um, and those go for a pretty penny on the dark web. So um, yeah, go through your email, um, clean it up. And what I mean by clean it up is unsubscribe from all the emails that you don't want so that when you get stuff that's actually important, you'll be able to review it and spend the time on it that you hope to. And uh, hopefully you'll achieve inbox zero. And that's the uh, golden way to know that you haven't missed any messages. Mm. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, one thing you mentioned is archiving, um, especially when it comes to uh, yeah, most of the time you, it's great to have a record. I rarely d delete emails unless they're junk or something that I'm, I want to unsubscribe from. Um, that being said, I usually just archive them because you can search them in the future. And, and most email uh, providers now have great search features that you can search and have a record of everything. Um, and then second, it just gets it out of the way of what's relevant because ultimately um, you can only focus on so many emails at a time. Um, and having hundreds if thousands, or thousands of emails uh, doesn't really help you prioritize. And then things fall through the cracks, not only from a security standpoint, but just from a management and, and organization. Excellent. Fantastic. Let's move on to password management. This is a fun one. Um, password managers have become more and more of a popular thing. A couple of years ago, Apple went and bought um, all of their employees 1Password accounts. And 1Password is a uh, pretty top tier password manager. It's the one I recommend. It costs money, so not everyone's interested in that. Um, there's, some, there's some free ones. StickyPasswords.com uh, is a free password manager. You get some limited function with it. For example, you can only keep it on one device and you can't sync your passwords between devices. Mm without paying for the full version. Um, so if you're gonna end up paying for it, I would just go with 1Password. But if you're looking for a free option for your kid or you know your grandmother and they just have one device and there's, there's no need to keep those all in a centrally located vault, um, Sticky Passwords is a great place to store that locally. So a password manager is a digital vault that you store all of your passwords in and generally it stores the details to the website as well. So let's say I have an account with my bank. It stores my bank website URL. It stores my username. It stores my password. And uh, in one password's case, it can even store a multi-factor authentication uh, seed so that I can generate a multi-factor authentication code so I can log in securely to my bank every single time and know that um, 
A, I don't have to remember my password because I only need the password to log in to my password vault. That's where one password gets its name. You only need one password to log in. Um, one password's got some other great features too, including Windows Hello sign in, which is um, the ability to use a biometric sign in. So if your computer, uh, especially Mac users or Dell XPS users, if you've got a fingerprint reader on your keyboard, I know some Lenovo ThinkPads have those too. Uh, you can actually sign into one password with your fingerprint, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, you can get it on mobile too. I've got that's it on cool. all of my devices. It it makes me signing into work accounts hyper secure because I can have a password that can't be brute force broken um, inside of several thousand years. Seriously, I'm not joking there. Yeah, um, right. And uh, I can rotate my passwords if I have to, or uh, have multi-factor authentication. And I don't have to keep all of that in my head because I've got too much going on in my head already. Um, <laughs> I hear yeah. <laughs> and uh, remembering passwords is, is, is not something that you need to do. In fact, if you can remember it, there's a chance that it's not secure enough. Um, now there's some, there's some ways around mm. that. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but save yourself the trouble and just get a password manager. Uh, gone are the days where it's okay to store your password in a, Excel sheet on your desktop. So if you're still doing that, or God forbid, you've got a sticky note under your mouse pad with your uh, banking passwords on there, um, let's not talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, go to onepassword.com, get signed up. Uh, they've got a free trial um, for one month. You can see what they're all about. And I happen to know, and they probably won't love me for saying this, but I happen to know if you contact their support and ask for an extra month free, they will absolutely give it to you. So nice. do that, see what they're all about. Um, another password manager is Dashlane or LastPass. Those ones are still are really good options. One password again is my favorite. Great. Uh, while you're yeah. at it, disable the password manager in your browser. Your browser will be really greedy and ask you to save passwords there. And that's not a very secure place to do that because your browser lives in memory, in your computer's memory constantly. And there's more than one type of virus that can steal passwords right out of memory. Mm. Um, and it's not uncommon for um, a browser to be able to pick up uh, what are called pups or potentially unwanted programs uh, stored in the browser that siphon off data. So don't become a victim to one of those, get a password manager. That's super helpful. So thanks. Yeah, I think uh, password manager, especially one password, I've enjoyed using that personally and professionally. And um, I say this all the time, but it probably saves me at least 15 minutes a day. Um, I just, just managing passwords, sharing passwords. Uh, and it's great. I think not only does it give me peace of mind that I have complex passwords and a, and a more complex system that I could even think of myself, that's protecting me and that I'm keeping stuff securely in there. But then also it's just time management. It's just the amount of applications and programs we use these days from a personal standpoint and then you throw in uh, professionally uh, and then your household and the ones you share with uh, your family or partner or, or other people um, in, your, in, your, in your family or extended family. Um, yeah, it's just the, the amount of time you save with password managers is awesome. And then uh, obviously just being more secure and having a less, uh, less chance of being hacked. Yeah, absolutely. If you go to one passwords um, priced site, um, it's really easy to see their, their different tiers for their product. And they have both a, a Teams version. So if you um, work in a professional environment and would like to set up one password for your team, there's a really great way of doing that with shared vaults so that you can put um, those shared passwords that everyone in your company or everyone in your team or everyone in your department needs access to in a very secure place, but you're not sharing passwords back and forth through email, uh, through Skype or by text message because that's really insecure. Um, but they also have a, a private family version. So, and I think that supports uh, up to three people and you might be able to add more licenses onto that. But that's really easy to be able to set up for um, a small family. Um, I quite like that subscription myself. 
Very cool. Yeah, I think that's that's great and good to know about the 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 family um, edition. I think there is yeah just a lot of opportunity to save time, um, not only from a personal standpoint but from a business standpoint and increased security. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's talk about MFA. So multi-factor authentication, or also known as two-factor authentication, is uh, really rather the silver bullet to stopping hackers from getting into your accounts. Now, there are a couple of really advanced ways around it, but um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't put this uh, security feature in place. So just because you hear um, that maybe somebody can get around multi-factor authentication doesn't mean that you're not stopping, you know, 99.999999% of all um, hacking attempts on your digital accounts because gone are the days that data lives just on your computer or just in the building that you work on, uh, work in. And chances are mm. you've got Office 365 or a Google account or a Costco account or something similar, right? And uh, you sign in and your photos are stored there. Your financial information is stored there. Your, your personal information is stored there. And um, in order to protect that, generally, if you've got a password that's either been used before and is out in the wild somewhere, has been compromised, is easy to guess, or can be brute force attacked. Uh, and brute force attacked is when um, uh, you set a machine to guess every single possible combination in sequence to try and guess your password. So if your password falls into one of those accounts um, or, or, or that site might potentially have a vulnerability in the future and someone steal that password, hackers will get right in. It's not a matter of how, because mm. that's going to happen. It's when. It's when mm. it's going to happen. So. Um, on top of needing a password, multi-factor authentication requires a code. And the secondary authentication form comes in multiple different ways. Uh, you're probably already familiar with your bank texting you a code to log in. And most banks have enabled multi-factor authentication by default across the board. If you don't have a bank that has already required that, please go in and see if they set it up. If they don't, contact their support team and see if they offer it. And if they don't, maybe consider switching banks. It's that important. Um, on top of that, it's probably really important to make sure you've got it set up on any account that holds your personal information. Um, the most primary would be your email account. Chances are your email account is the recovery account for all of your accounts. And whoever has access to your email account can recover the password to any of your accounts. So. If I just have access to my email, I can still get into my bank even if I've forgotten my password, even if I for don't have my multi-factor authentication code. So having multi-factor authentication set up on your email account as well so that hackers can't get in is really important. Uh, I know at least Google um, has a really great multi-factor authentication um, program already set up. If they see you trying to log in from a device that's not ever been signed in from before or from a country that you're not from uh, or from a state that you haven't visited recently, they absolutely pop up a little notification on your phone or send you an email and say, hey, is this you, right? And you want something mm -hmm. like that for all of your accounts. And one of the best ways of doing that is a multi-factor authentication code. Those are pretty easy to set up. Um, in my um, how-to guide, I've got um, some links on how to set it up for some really popular uh, sites, uh, Etsy, um, you know, YouTube, uh, Netflix, uh, PayPal, all of those, all of those places that you might upload or store information. Now, now there are some applications that can manage multi-factor authentication for you, so that you don't have to get a code texted to your phone, um, and those make it really simple to keep that on your computer, and. You may say, well, if I've got my password and a hacker's got my computer, they might be able to log in. Well, true, but they would actually have to physically steal your laptop to get mm -hmm. in. And you can disable, in, in this case, I'm recommending Authy or 1Password. Authy only does multi-factor authentication, but 1Password does password management and multi-factor authentication. So check out 1Password again. 
Um, but if someone steals your laptop, you can totally disable that account for that IP address um, or call support and have them change your password, that kind of a thing. So again, multi-factor authentication is a good thing. You should set it up. Almost every site has it now. Um, if they don't, consider an alternative site. Great. Thanks. And yeah, I completely agree. I think there is the, uh, I like how you mentioned one password or using a password manager to handle your, your multi-factor authentication. Um, I think that seems like it's, you know, two birds with one stone. Uh, and, and also, uh, yeah, makes it a lot easier to manage both of those security factors. It really is. It, one password goes above and beyond because they actually have a, a triple verification when you set up your one password account. So I already have an existing one password account, but if my laptop were to die today, and I go to the store and buy a new one and try and set it up for the first time, there's three things I have to put in. One mm -hmm. is a secret key. One is my account name. And the other one is my password, my master password. I have to have right. all three of those things in there. And I get prompted on any other device that is already signed into one password mm. asking if this attempt is me. Like that's huge. It's really difficult to break into an account that has that many factors of authentication. So you get all of that signed up with one password, right? And you store all of your passwords in there. Not only will one password tell you if you're if the password that you've entered for your bank, let's say. Let's say you store your bank password there and you're all excited about signing into your bank. One password will tell you, hey, that's not a super secure password. Next time you sign in, let's change that password. They can walk you through the steps of changing your password. When you change it to something super obscure, really long and random, it'll save, prompt and save that password for you. You can include your multi-factor authentication token in there so that it can generate mm. that code next time you go to sign in. It, super cool. Yeah, I I don't know. Maybe this maybe one password should just give me free accounts for life after all the good <laughs> things I've said about them today. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're they're a great company. They are. I completely agree. Fantastic. Let's move on to reviewing your accounts online. What are some best uh, practices for this? Sure. Yeah. So as you go through your email inbox, like I talked about earlier, here's your chance to go through and 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 find that data that you forgot existed out on the web somewhere. Um, maybe you've got two Facebook accounts. Maybe you've got a Facebook account that you don't like. Maybe you've got multiple social media accounts that have your personal information. Uh, and uh, I'm not judging you. That's, that's fine. You do you. Um, but uh, think about if that's another attack vector you'd like to have mm. unsecured. Mm. Because sometimes it's difficult to secure social media accounts, especially some of the newer ones, as they come out and gain popularity. Um, mm. And if you don't think that social media is stealing your information, think again. It's been on the news for a long time. If you're not paying for the service, you're the product. Mm. You're what they're selling. So think about that. Um, and uh, then think about whether you really need that account or not. And whether that would actually provide an attack vector if that account was compromised to some other account that you have. So for example, if you've got a security question on your bank and it can be answered with information from your public social media profile, mm -hmm. that's a security vector, right? That's a, sorry, that's a threat vector. And you can stop that by either hiding your public information on Facebook or deleting that account entirely so that even if it's compromised, no one can get into your bank account. Um, and I've talked a lot about financial information here, but just as dangerous would be somebody breaking in and stealing patent information from your Google Drive account if you were an, a private inventor or stealing, you know, your book information or whatever you're writing, um, private photos, um, private, all sorts of things. Um, if you've got photos or you've got a document full of important folders on Google Drive, that's linked to your Gmail account, right? So definitely secure your accounts. If you've got more than one email address, consider why. Is it really that important to have multiple email addresses? I have two. I've got a personal one and a work one. And uh, those are really the only two areas that I exist in is personal and professional. I don't really have any other you know, hobby email addresses, so to speak. And uh, obviously, 
you know, I'm not telling you, you can't have them, but make sure that they can't be combined into one. Mm. Make sure that there isn't a way that you can reduce the edge geometry of your threat vector, mm. right? Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, and I like what you said there too, when it comes to uh, the, the association, right? So if you have a password or a security question, that even if they're completely unrelated applications, right? It's your bank mm -hmm. and it's your Google Photos or whatever your other application is that's not anywhere related. iCloud, for example, yeah. Yeah, if there's any or other, uh, and that's where definitely password managers come in where you have multiple, when you have different types of passwords, but if you're using the same password or especially with security questions where um, you purposefully only, you have, oh, you have a finite amount of answers for those security questions, use those security questions across the board um, mm -hmm. and you have you, you have those security questions just thinking through all the times you put out those security questions right like oh you know if, you, right. if they're on yeah. 30 different websites think about all all the opportunities um you know who knows if just even just one of those uh websites gets breached it could compromise all of those applications absolutely uh, which is, yeah yeah scary and and most of the accounts i have that company's been breached at some point. I have a LinkedIn account. <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn right. was breached. I have a, I used to have a Facebook account. Facebook was breached, right? Like right. name a, a site and more than likely that account's been breached at some time and people have had to change their passwords. And if it wasn't account details, it was full information on that particular user, right? You, you can't even shop at Target. Right? right. Um, so it, it's a crazy world and you really have to protect yourself. Definitely. Yeah. I think to your point, it's, it's uh, most of the large companies or a lot of them have. And so, and if you're a customer of theirs or a consumer of theirs, then um, the trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Let's, uh, we're coming up on here on the hour. Um, let's talk about securing your device. Yeah. Let's so do that. Most devices at least mobile devices anymore, have a, have a way for you to encrypt the hard drive on it. It's not really a hard drive, but the internal storage of the device. Um, and that allows a hacker, if they were to steal your device, or if you were to lose it, say, um, or for it to get stolen on the bus or something like that, and then it goes up for sale on eBay, right? Chances are the person who mm -hmm. stole it isn't able to run the advanced scripts that would be needed to steal your data. But there's people who scour eBay for locked devices and then hack them and look for information. Mm -hmm. And it's not particularly difficult if your device isn't encrypted, especially Windows laptops, Mac mm -hmm. laptops, stuff like that. Really easy to get into. 10 minutes and a screwdriver. I can tell you all sorts of information about you. Absolutely. So um, consider only purchasing devices that can be encrypted. Um, and that's a topic for another day, but at least on your mobile device, on your cell mm. phone, go into settings, look for encryption. Um, most modern devices have the ability for you to search in your settings for a particular uh, phrase. Just look for encryption. Chances are you can turn it on. Quick Google search or uh, look at the blog post I made. And uh, I've got some instructionals on how to encrypt your mobile device. So really important awesome. if your device could get stolen. Less so for desktop devices that are locked in your house. But mm. if you've got a device that sits out in a public place, churches, you've got check-in devices, uh, stores, you've got check-in devices, um, you know, anything that sits in a public place or could get stolen really ought to be encrypted. Great. And last but not least, data in transit. How can we protect mm. the the sensitive data in transit? Yeah, good question. So um, I, I've talked about this a little bit before, but pretty much gone are the days that your data stays only on your device, right? You've got accounts, you've got an iCloud account, you've got a Google Drive account, you've got a YouTube account where you upload information about you or about things that you care about and are passionate about. And chances are you don't want that to go to everyone. You've got a subset of people you're willing mm -hmm. to give that to. Um, or you, you know, if someone uses it, you want to be appropriately attributed to it. So with that, you need to secure your data as it moves from your device out to the cloud. And it doesn't matter how secure your computer is, and it doesn't matter how secure the cloud account is that you're using, if your data can be intercepted on the way. So try using only secure websites, 
right? Um, there's, if you go to um, the IEEE's website, um, they're the, um, the uh, forefathers of the internet, so to speak. And uh, they've got an extension called um, HTTPS Everywhere. Mm. You can just Google search HTTPS Everywhere. And that little extension will sit in your web browser and it will warn you anytime you go to a website that doesn't have HTTPS. And that S is the secure version of that website. It'll warn you, it'll stop you from going there if you tell it to, and it will try and enforce that you only, it'll tell your web browser to only accept the secure version. So if there's multiple versions of the website, it'll assume that you want the secure version. And that's really helpful. That means when you go to enter your credit card details, for example, on uh, Amazon's website or some other um, market's website, uh, then you know your, your, um, your data is not being scooped off of that website by mm. somebody malicious. In between you and that website, though, is a network connection. And before you get out to your Comcast internet, your CenturyLink internet, whoever it is, and they securely transfer your data, you may be sitting next to a compromised wireless access point at Starbucks, at your local Jiffy Lube while you get your oil changed, at your local restaurant, maybe even your friend's house. Maybe they don't even know their Wi-Fi is compromised, right? Mm -hmm. Using a VPN solution, which is a virtual private network, that allows you to create a secure tunnel from your device all the way to the website that you're going to. And just like a hose, it secures that information all the way to where you're going. And those aren't free, unfortunately. You either have to have hardware yourself to be able to do it yourself, um, which isn't terribly difficult, but that's a different discussion, uh, or you need to subscribe to a solution. And NordVPN solution is a pretty inexpensive, real bare bones, nothing more than you need uh, solution. So check them out um, if you're not just only ever staying at home. So if you're a student and you're on the go, I would use NordVPN. If you're a traveling salesman, use NordVPN. Awesome. Thanks, Josiah. Super helpful. Absolutely. It looks like um, we've answered most of the questions you submitted in the uh, registration. And uh, there is one question, though, that I don't think we covered, which was, um, Josiah, if you want to briefly uh, elaborate on uh, how are password managers uh, more secure if you still have that master password that can get in. Um, talk to me about how you can make that more secure or uh, isn't that still just as unsecure as your email? Sure, okay. So uh, geometric progression is a term that talks about um, how the more of a thing you have, how exponentially, um, how, I'm trying to break this down, how exponentially more powerful it is, right? Mm. So in this case, we're talking about vulnerabilities. So the okay. more accounts that you have that are accessible by any one password are by definition less secure, right? And so you would immediately think, well, if I put all of my passwords in one egg carton, so to speak, it would be really right. easy to break that egg carton, right? Right. But... Uh, it doesn't work quite that way because if that place is secure enough, then it actually mm. protects all of the edge cases as well. So mm. you're actually centralizing it. It's actually more secure. And so the reason it's more secure is because 1Password takes a ton of time with their developers to make sure that your vault really is secure. And mm. that's a lot more so than say Apple and their iCloud account or Google and their Google Drive account, right? 1Password has teams focused on this specific issue and this issue only. So when you put your passwords in there, not only do I recommend that they be long and complicated, but I recommend that your master password to log in is long and complicated. And on top of that, 1Password's got multiple um, factors of authentication. I talked about this earlier. You've got your username, which is tied to an email address so that you know when you've logged in. You've got other devices that when you sign in, it notifies you. You've got your master password. You've got a secret key. And so these four different verification
authentication methods when you go to sign in, that's enormous, right? Google Drive doesn't totally. have that. iCloud doesn't have that. Your bank doesn't have that. And these are institutions that promise you that their data <laughs> is, that your data is secure on their site, right? So you can go a step further by locking all of that away, making sure that you don't even know your password, uh, because why would you need to in a modern day like today with a password manager? I can just copy and paste my password right out. So cool. That's helpful. Thanks, Josiah. Well, great. We're just going right past the hour here. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, thanks, Josiah, for your time. That was super fun and uh, learned a lot myself. Uh, thanks you guys for having any... me, Taylor. Yeah, it's great having you. Thanks again. If anybody has any additional questions or comments, or uh, if you want any more additional information on what we shared today, feel free to reach out. We will be following up with a copy and recording of this webinar and a link uh, for the blog post. So thanks everyone again for your time. Uh, we appreciate it and take care.